In the electric car world, Tesla gets all the hype in the media. However, it was Nissan who really introduced the first mass market EV in America all the way back in 2010. So today, I'm at Road America just outside of Milwaukee, Wisconsin with the rest of the members of the Midwest Automotive Media Association for their spring run event. And today, I've got my hands on the 2019 Nissan Leaf Plus. Nissan claims this is the best-selling EV globally with sales exceeding 400,000 units back in March of this year. So the big question I want to answer with this extended range LEAF version with 226 miles of range, does the LEAF have what it takes to challenge the best from Tesla, Chevy, and Hyundai's new Kona? That's what we're here to find out. So if you guys remember the first generation Leaf, that was a very peculiar looking car and it really stood out in a kind of bad way. I wasn't really a big fan of the design of that vehicle. It just looked too weird from all angles. Now you can see when Nissan introduced the second generation Leaf back in 2017, they went with a much more conventional look that I think really works on this car. It's definitely one of the better looking in terms of the mainstream EVs. I think it's better looking than the new uh, Kia Niro EV and the Hyundai Kona. You can see the front fascia has the current corporate Nissan design language, their V motion and grill. It's kind of got no actual scoops because remember this is an, uh, an EV. It doesn't have an internal combustion engine. And then you can see here, my tester being the SL trim has LED headlights. It's got LED low and high beams, LED daytime running lights, incandescent turn signals, and incandescent fog lights, however. So I'm surprised that Nissan didn't go with a full LED design, kind of giving this thing more of a high-tech look to it. Overall, um, you can't really tell this is the actual plus model until you open up the charge port that Nissan likes to put up at the front. You can see this one has the new Chatamo uh, DC fast charge. It'll charge up to 100 kilowatt hours. If you guys uh, find that uh, fast charger, you can actually charge this thing up uh, about 150 miles in about 60 minutes. So that's definitely a nice addition. Very much needed for something that's going to have the higher capacity battery, which we'll talk about in just a second when I go underneath the hood of this vehicle. Now, looking at the actual rest of the proportions of the Leaf, you can see it's got a very conventional hatchback look to it, complete with that floating rear roof design that Nissan likes to do. And then most of the Leaf Plus models will have these 17-inch wheels on these Michelin Energy eco-efficient tires. Uh, they're riding on two 15-size uh, uh, wide tires. Remember, the Leaf is still a front-wheel drive vehicle. If you guys go for the SV trims and up, you'll have this 17-inch wheel design. These wheels are not unique to the SL that I'm showing you here. Now, Nissan actually kept the size of this vehicle relatively the same as the previous generation. Its wheelbase at 106.3 inches long didn't change, and its overall length at 176.3 inches long is actually about an inch and a half longer versus the previous generation. So they kept the proportions very tidy. This is roughly about 10 inches shorter than a Tesla Model 3 if you're gonna compare the two. You could also compare this car to the Chevrolet Bolt, which I think Nissan does a much better job in terms of the design. And then of course there's the Kia Niro EV and the Hyundai Kona, which the Kona is actually a little bit smaller than this if you can believe it. Now at the back, again, it's got a much more cleaner look to it. I like this all black portion here that goes across the middle part of the tailgate. You do have an LED combination rear taillights, so I'm surprised Nissan didn't go with a full LED design. You have some zero emission badges to remind people that you're saving trees and driving a vehicle that doesn't pollute or anything like that. Though, of course, there's no visible exhaust tips, but there is this kind of rear diffuser area, which I guess helps with the overall aerodynamics. Nissan says this new generation is also much more aerodynamic. Now, being a hatchback model, this is going to be more practical than something like a Tesla Model 3. And Nissan says that when you have, uh, when you open up the trunk area, you're looking at around 27.3 uh, cubic feet of space. Of course, there is a nice lower floor area here, so it's very deep deep storage area, which is definitely good. You can see this is the bag that comes with the car when you guys are trying to just uh, trickle charge it, where it gives you the 110 volt outlet. Underneath the floor here, you can see there's no actual storage area. So that's something that, you know, some competitors also give you, Tesla specifically, where you have that under the storage. Those seats do fold down in a 64 manner, but it doesn't really create a flat load floor. So when you fold down those seats, Nissan only says you get around 30 cubic feet of space, which isn't really all that much. That number can't be right, but it is uh, known that some of the competitors uh, do offer a little bit more space because the seats fold down in a much flatter arrangement. Moving on to the inside of the Nissan Leaf Plus, let me first briefly talk about the key fob. It is the same corporate intelligent access key that Nissan's been using for years. There's a slight change here where you can lock and unlock the charge port uh, from the actual remote fob, but as you approach the door handle of the Leaf, you can see there's a black button on the chrome door handle here. If you touch that button here, it will lock and it will unlock the door for you. 
Now opening up the door and looking at the interior, you can see this particular one here is the mid-level SV trim. It does come with these heated cloth seats with an eight or a 10 way uh, power adjustment for the driver. No memory seats. Keep in mind, if you guys want leather, you'll have to step it up to uh, the SL trim, which also includes the leather. That's what the L basically stands for. This one here with the blue stitching, the uh, blue stitching on the wheel around the rest of the interior makes a good first impression. Um, but if you guys are looking for something a little bit nicer, the SL trim is also available uh, to give you that leather seat option. So now getting inside, the Leaf is a hatchback and because of that it has a really nice easy step in height and then when you shut the door it actually sounds relatively solid for uh, an economy based hatchback. I'm pretty pleased with the way that sounds. Now to start the vehicle up, just like every other modern car, there's a button down here to start the up the electronics. There's no gas engine remember so just put your foot on the brake, push that button here and you can see the gauges do a sweep. The Leaf comes with a very large uh, central display here in the instrument panel that shows you a bunch of information. There's no tack. Remember, there's no gas engine with this car. It's always been a full EV. But looking at, the, or at a glance, looking at the rest of this cabin, you can see I like the conventional route that Nissan has gone here. You know, with this you know eight-inch Nissan Connect infotainment system, it does include Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, so that's always a really nice plus. Um, you can see here the graphics. They're not super you know impressive looking, but this is pretty much going to get the job done. It has very snappy, quick responses. You can go back to the Nissan display here. There's your Nissan head unit there. There's also embedded navigation with this particular trim. It's the, la this la the latest Nissan navigation maps, which honestly, this is better than what Infinity puts in a lot of their products. So props to Nissan for giving the Leaf an actual modern infotainment system. The materials, you can see, it's all actually hard touch plastic here, which I kind of expected because giving the price point of this car and considering how much money they put into the vehicle, uh, into the electric motors and whatnot. It's all hard touch plastic. There's this interesting silver painted plastic trim here. It's all hard touch plastic down here. You're not going to really touch the dash. What you will be touching, however, is the door panels. And this is also a hard touch material. So I was slightly disappointed there. It is padded over here and slightly padded over here with the same fabric that's on the seats. The windows are only a one touch auto up down for the driver. Everything else is just a uh, manual. It's a power window, but it's not an actual automatic one touch. You do have a heated steering wheel here, which is nice. You can turn on the steering assist over over here, open up your charge port uh, from this area. You can also set the charging. Your dimmer switch is over there. Uh, down here, you can see there is a little bit of storage. Um, there's a cup holder. It's all hard touch plastic. The steering wheel, for some reason, Nissan still doesn't do a telescoping adjustment, which does um, hurt the driving uh, position for some drivers. So make sure you try this vehicle out. Also, I just don't like how it kind of cheaply falls. You know, it kind of shows its economy car roots, how uh, they don't have a tilt and telescoping adjustment. I think that's kind of uh, a little bit of an insult, especially, you know, considering how expensive this car actually is. They should have just thrown that in. Um, I do like the way the steering wheel looks. It is attractive. It's their flat bottom D cut wheel, which is nice. You can see this button here turns on and off the pro pilot assist, which does come on this SL trim. You have to get this trim to get it over here on the center stack, you can see, um, I'm not going to go too much in debt with this, but I do want to show you guys the reversing camera. Uh, you can see Nissan doesn't offer the 360 camera like they offer on some of their other models. Surprised they don't. Um, but it does give you a nice backup camera with trajectory, uh, which is good. Um, it shows decent resolution, decent quality. Uh, if you want to go to your audio information here, you can see there's where your audio presets are. They're down here, which is all nicely laid out. It has good graphics. So I'm pretty happy with this infotainment system. It's not the most impressive, but it's going to get the job done. A lot of people are going to be happy with that. And you can see here there's single zone automatic climate control. It also has like a uh, economy mode, of course. This is going to lower the range whenever you guys decide to turn on the actual heating system. You have your two level heated seats down here, a USB port, a power outlet, and then there's an area where you can put your phone. This right here, is, there's a dedicated eco button here, and then there's an e-pedal switch over here, which is supposed to help you with um, not driving this vehicle so aggressively. It'll push back on the accelerator pedal whenever you floor it. This shifter here is carried over from the previous generation. If you want to go to park, obviously there's a P button here. Reverse, you have to kind of go over here and then push up. That goes into reverse. And then for drive, come back to the left again and then pull it down. That'll go to drive. That'll also put you into the B mode, which is the braking mode, which is the high regen braking. That's always something that's very important for an EV. Down here, you can see there's an electronic parking brake. You have your two cup holders, and then there's a nice padded armrest right here with a, uh, a good storage, although it is a little bit on the smaller side. The seats, um, these are, the, of course, the zero gravity NASA inspired seats. They're very comfortable, um, and I really uh, like the fabric that Nissan uses. Even though it's not leather, 
leather. The fabric feels really nice. It's also a slightly unique look to it. The glove compartment you can see is huge. Uh, the lid itself is damped, but it's not lined with felt. But I like how there's very good storage there because there's a little bit lacking in terms of storage over here. Um, but overall, the inside of the new leaf definitely takes a lot of conventional cues from the current crop of nissan products i think a lot of people are going to find it modern and easy to use and very traditional so if you like that make sure you check out the cabin of the new 2019 leaf now the back seat area of the leaf also surprisingly is good when you're actually sitting back here but on paper nissan says there's only 33.5 inches of legroom which is paltry you could get basically 36 inches of legroom in something like the kia nero or the chevrolet bolt now getting back here at five foot seven i am noticing the seat here the cushion is raised up significantly but it does give me a nice view there's a surprisingly big hump over here i'm just surprised that there's no flat floor to kind of give you more space in the middle passenger areas. There's decent foot space, but I do notice that it is tight back here compared to some competitors. Nissan does give you two map pockets, no rear seat vents or heated rear seats. The materials back here are also hard touch plastic, and there's also no armrest that folds down. So it seems the back seat is a little bit spartan compared to some competitors. So if you're looking for a vehicle, an EV that has a bigger back seat, I might suggest checking out some of the Leaf's direct rivals. Now underneath the hood of the Leaf, unlike some competitors that have a front area nissan puts the electric motor basically on display over here in the front area just like a conventional car i kind of wonder why they did this i think a lot of ev owners like the fact that you have a front trunk space area but regardless you're looking at an upgraded motor and battery pack for this leaf e plus the standard model has 110 kilowatt hour electric motor which translates to 147 horsepower and like 223 uh, foot pounds of torque this one has a 40 percent larger battery which gives you 150 kilowatt hours total this one makes about 214 horsepower and 250 foot-pounds of torque. So a nice healthy increase is still not quite as much as what you get from like a Tesla Model 3 standard range. I believe the Chevrolet Bolt also gives you more power uh, and it does give you a little slightly more horsepower than the uh, Kona Electric and the Kia Nero. Now if you guys are planning to charge this vehicle up that's always an important factor. 226 miles of range as I said versus 147 and when you guys find a level 2 charger the plus version will take about 11 and a half hours to charge on the level 2 so that's something that you hook up to your driver. Over 30 hours if you're going to trickle charge the vehicle and if you guys find uh, a Chatham 100 kilowatt hour fast charger, a DC fast charger, Nissan says it'll roughly add about 150 miles in about 50 minutes depending on you know the speed of the charge rate. Now this thing is heavy because of all the batteries. Remember Leafs are only front wheel drive. Uh, this car weighs as it sits around 3,800 pounds so it's pretty close to the weight of like a Tesla Model 3. So if you guys, thinking that, if you guys are thinking because this is a front drive economy car based hatchback that it's lighter, it's actually not. So remember the batteries are all are going to add a lot of a lot of weight. It all goes out through a single speed reduction gear transmission. Let's get out on the road and see how it all performs. So first setting off in the all new Nissan Leaf. I actually haven't had a chance to even drive this generation at all. So my first impressions are pretty positive. Um, it's a very refined car. Uh, it feels like a very conventional car as well. I mean, you, if you guys have driven any EV car, the Leaf kind of just feels pretty conventional in that sense. It has really light steering. The car feels really nimble and small. It has very good visibility out of here. Uh, and the ride quality, while it is firm, uh, you can kind of feel the weight of this car. Uh, of course, with an electric car, all the batteries are kind of lined uh, underneath the car, making this thing have a lower center of gravity. And overall, it's just a very pleasant feeling car. It's a really easy car to drive, which is why you know cars like this are just such great commuter cars. The steering feel is pretty light and numb, but the car actually has a relatively quick ratio. Um, so when you turn the wheel, the car changes directions pretty quick. And then when you put your foot down, <laughs> it has kind of the instant ease torque which is what you really are looking for um, with a vehicle like this so that's important now of course with the plus model Nissan says this has about 40% more battery capacity and horsepower so 214 is pretty significant this is a front-wheel drive car remember though so when you put your foot down it will spin out its tires and Nissan says this should get to 60 in around six and a half seconds which honestly it feels pretty fast, but the front tires, as you can see, are spinning. The road is a little damp, so I'll have to wait until I actually drive this thing back in the DC area on better roads. I'm here in you know, Elkhart Lake, Wisconsin. I was expecting the weather to be really nice and sunny today, and instead it's atrocious. It's cold and it's rainy, so uh, bear with me while we try to you know, deal with the weather conditions that were dealt with here. But the ride quality, as I said earlier, is surprisingly good. Um, the car itself is just really easy to drive. The seats are really comfortable and soft. I wish that they were leather, though I just prefer leather. That's a personal preference of mine. 
Do I know left or right here? You're supposed to go right. Okay. I mean, I mean I'm not going to do the whole thing, but we'll just we'll we'll. Just go, go wherever the truck is. Into. Yes. Uh, yeah. He's in it. Oh. We'll just go straight. Just straight. In okay. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna try it again from a stop. <laughs> Is that because the car lifted up? <laughs> it did. So let's try this car from a stop. There's no sport mode or anything like that. I've had, I've had the eco mode turned off. Now it's off. So now let's just floor it. You can see the the car starts to build in terms of power. It's a it's a it's a very gradual, almost linear feel. I wanted this thing to have a little bit more pull from a stop. It seems like Nissan's limiting the torque. I mean, this thing has 250 foot pounds of torque. Now, when my when I floor it, and I'm kind of just like coasting, it does feel a little bit quicker. But from a dead stop, it feels sluggish, kind of the way that the Kia Niro EV uh, feels. So I'm, I'm thinking that Nissan is limiting the torque to prevent the wheel spin. It will spin its front tires when you kind of get onto an uneven road surface. But overall, uh, the Leaf is definitely pleasant driving. I haven't actually driven the standard model, uh, the one with only the 40 kilowatt hour battery. But the added power of this is definitely a huge improvement. Um, Nissan did a good job with at least you know upping the battery capacity. This is basically what we expect in the EV game. I'm just not entirely sure that Nissan, you know, brought it in sooner. I mean, they're a little bit late to the party with this. Um, so it's making me question what's the reason why you choose the Leaf? I mean, it has a very conventional look on the outside. It's got a comfortable ride. It's easy to drive. I guess the pricing is probably where the Leaf has a little bit of an advantage. It's a little bit less expensive than the Kia and the Chevrolet Bolt. And you can still also take the full EV tax credit, which is a, also a really huge uh, deciding factor with this car. There's literally no one out here. I know. <laughs> so, as you can see, when you hit uneven surfaces, the front tires will kind of spin, but it's not kind of the most dramatic spin like you get in a gas car, because remember, remember, electric motor, all the torque right off of, um, or basically as soon as your foot goes to the floor, single speed reduction gear transmission, it's got a really, you know, nice way that it delivers the power. It's just very unscary, I guess. It's a very easy car to modulate. Um, you really have to be messing up hard to get this thing to feel scary whenever you're driving. Now, it is also relatively quiet in here. I find that it's a little bit quieter than my Tesla Model 3 back home. Um, there's a little bit less in terms of road noise in this car. So I think that Nissan good, good, did a good job with the isolation in here. Because remember, EV, there's no electric motor. You need it to be as quiet as possible uh, whenever you're driving something like this because you're going to be hearing every other noise since there's no gas engine to kind of cover it up. But overall, the Leaf is a pleasant driving car. I like the way it feels compared to the near EV that I drove. Um, it just feels a little bit smaller, a little bit more sportier driving, which is good because Nissan has been going in the direction of kind of like a soft, boring way, but the Leaf is a surprisingly fun car. Honestly, they make a Nismo version, I believe, in Japan, or they were thinking about making one. I would love to see them do an all-wheel drive version Nismo with like over 300 horsepower. I think that could be a really fun addition to the lineup. So even though the Leaf may not be the sexiest choice if you guys are looking for an all-electric commuter car, you can't deny the proven aspect of this name. The car's been around since 2010, and since then, Nissan has sold over 400,000 of these cars globally, which I guess makes it the best-selling electric car in the world, although I'm not I wouldn't be surprised if some of the other brands overtake the Leaf in the coming years. Now, Nissan managed to move about 15,000 of these Leafs here in America last year, which actually makes the car relatively good in terms of sales, although it's about half what they used to do back in 2014, which was, I guess, the peak sales of the Leaf. Now, overall, the second generation model, I like what they've done with the design. It's much more conventional looking. It's good looking. The interior is user friendly. It's easy to use. It comes with the tech features. It has relatively good space and the driving dynamics. I like the, ad the added power, the acceleration. I still wish that Nissan offered all wheel drive on this thing. I think they really should offer all wheel drive. Um, especially considering the price point of this car. Now, if you guys are looking to purchase a Leaf, it's actually one of the lesser expensive models. If you guys go for the standard model, that's gonna cost around just under $30,000 at $29,995. Add $5,000 if you guys want the plus version for the 226 miles of range. I'd highly recommend doing that. It puts the price right on top of something like a Tesla Model 3 standard range, although that's a little bit more, but you get a little bit more range. All the other brands are gonna be roughly around that same price point. Now, keep in mind, Nissan has not hit the actual 200,000 uh, sales cap.
cap in the US here, so you can still take the full $7,500 tax credit, which is good because this car can get expensive if you guys add up the options. Now, this one here being the mid-level SV trim with the tech package that adds the ProPilot Assist is around $40,000. That actually makes it a little bit more expensive than I was thinking. Again, that's Tesla Model 3 money, uh, but you do get a little bit more cargo space with the Leaf because it's a hatchback, but the Tesla also has a couple of other features, the supercharger network. So there are still some reasons to purchase the Tesla, which is probably why I'm seeing, or we're seeing the Leaf sales not quite as high. And it's really up to, up to Nissan. They need to kind of make this car a little bit more special feeling. All-wheel drive would be a huge addition. Now, if you guys add basically the SL trim with everything, this car can cost almost $44,000, but once you subtract the $7,500 tax credit, it does make the car a little bit more affordable. But I hope you guys have enjoyed my full overview on this 2019 Nissan Leaf Plus. If you're also looking to see the latest cars I'm testing, be sure to follow me on Instagram at redline underscore reviews, like us on Facebook. And as always, guys, please keep subscribing to the Redline Reviews YouTube channel for all the latest reviews. Thank you so much for watching. I'll catch you all in the next video. States all the way back in 2010. So today I'm just outside of Milwaukee, Wisconsin at, okay, sorry. <laughs> okay, so stop right there at the front. Okay, okay. The mass produced EV plug-in trend, EV mass produced, started selling the mass, first mass produced, okay. <laughs> with the rest of the members of the MAMA, no, with the Midwest, <laughs> sorry, MAMA, I was like, wait. <laughs> Midwest Automotive Media Association, that's I need to open that. What, sorry, what? The Model 3 Plus is a little bit more money, like two grand, but you get a little bit more range. So this one being the SL trim, it's an SV. Because <laughs> <laughs> cars like the Bolt and the Tesla don't offer the full 75 uh, EV uh, tax credit from the feds. Sorry, <laughs> I forgot to talk about that. Where can I restart? I don't know. <laughs> I know, so is mine. Uh, let's just try it from the start. I'm sorry. What? <laughs> yeah, I have to do it from the Oh, it's cold. <laughs> you know what really pisses me off? I, oh, the interior is wrong then because I said it was an SL because the window sticker says it's